A brand new car, just as it comes off the assembly line, is a thing of beauty. A beauty we see mostly in the flawless, gleaming new finish. The quality and appearance of that finish is difficult to duplicate by any method of refinishing available today. This side of this video disc will show you how to make several paint and sheet metal repairs without having to fill or repaint the original finish. But before we do that, we'd like to show you how the Ford Motor Company achieves this quality finish in the first place. The effort, the dedication, the technology, the commitment to quality that Ford has made at every step of the finishing process to give you cars that look like this in the first place. Then we'll talk about how you can keep them looking this way. At the plant, after the bodies have been assembled and inspected for smoothness and quality of the metal surface, they are put through the first pre-paint preparation step, a phosphate surface treatment that cleans the metal of any residues that would affect the adhesion of paint. From the phosphate line, the bodies are completely immersed in the e-coating tank. During this process, the bodies are strongly charged electrically with an opposite charge on the e-coat material. This causes the e-coating to fill every nook, cranny, and crevice in the body to provide maximum protection against rust and corrosion. After the e-coating is completely air-dried, the body is sprayed with an even coat of primer on an automatic prime spray line and thoroughly dried again in special production drying ovens. From there, the bodies go to a prime coat inspection area where they are thoroughly checked for any defects of any kind that would affect the final finish of the car. If any defects are found, such as rough spots or sags, they are fixed right there before that body can be released for finished painting. After the body is past the prime coat inspection, they are sent to the paint spray booths for color coat painting. The major part of color coat spraying is computer controlled with only a minor amount of hand spraying in hard to cover areas. The spray heads in the booth are supplied from a computer controlled selection center that is connected to bulk tanks containing every color available in the line at the time. Before each body is painted, the heads are purged with clear solvent to be sure no residual paint from the previous color remains in the head. As the body moves into position, the spray heads position themselves at the correct distance from the surface and begin spraying, following the contour of the body as it moves. Again, this is an electrostatic spray process with the body having an electrical charge on it and the paint particles receiving an opposite charge as they leave the gun. This causes the paint spray to be pulled against the body evenly around curves and bends and inside all the openings. Each spray head and paint delivery line is monitored by its own separate pressure gauge that allows the operator to check the system constantly to be sure everything is working all right. The atmosphere in the booth is fully temperature and humidity controlled to ensure the best spraying conditions and that no dirt or foreign material gets into the paint to spoil the finish. Spray density and conditions of the booth are monitored constantly by the latest laser sensing technology to provide the best quality conditions available today. And that's the only reason for all these steps and all of this highly advanced equipment to provide a top quality final finish that will stay that way. After receiving two full color coats and two additional clear coats for metallic and special paints, the bodies move through drying ovens that heat them to 180 degrees Fahrenheit. This is hot enough to soften or melt trim parts and seals on a complete car. So this temperature cannot be duplicated in refinishing. The ovens harden the paint before it is exposed to the air in the plant. As the bodies emerge from the ovens, they are immediately inspected for imperfections in the paint. 
and for overall finish quality before being sent on to the next step. At this point in the finish process, after painting, there is an employee quality inspection center, one of many set up throughout all Ford plants at various stages of production and assembly process. At these centers, employees are encouraged to inspect the results of the work they've been doing and to report any defects they find. Suggestions on how to improve quality and eliminate defects are also sought at these centers and all suggestions are seriously considered. From the first inspection area at the end of the paint line, the bodies move to a polish area. A final inspection at the end of the polish line releases the body for trim buildup, or if necessary, returns it for paint repair. And that's how the beautiful finish is achieved in the first place. But you can also see why it's difficult to duplicate this finish by any repainting methods in use today. That's why the rest of this side of this disc is devoted to ways in which you can repair minor surface damage and defects and still preserve the original finish and appearance quality applied at the factory on Ford Motor Company products. The methods and techniques we'll be discussing from now on are used at the factory to make cosmetic repairs of any damage that may have occurred during assembly and can be used in your dealership to make repairs on both new and used cars. When the cars come off the assembly line, they go directly to a final inspection area where all parts of the car are checked before shipment. Any vehicles found to have cosmetic imperfections are sent to this area for repair. To make these kinds of non-painting surface repairs in your dealership, it's extremely important to have a well-lit area that makes it easy to see the surface of the paint clearly from all angles. As we proceed through the various repair procedures, we'll see how important the right angle on the lighting is. The area should also be large enough to allow free movement and room to work completely around all sides of a vehicle. For purposes of demonstrating these techniques, we have set up a cosmetic repair area in a studio similar to the one you might arrange at your dealership. We're going to begin the discussion of cosmetic body repairs without having to fill and paint by talking about dings and dents in the sheet metal that have not cracked or chipped the paint. In such cases, the original finish usually can be preserved. This is the kind of dent we're talking about. We know from experience that many people would repair this by filling it and then repainting the area. The technique we're going to show you for repairing this dent without painting is not new. In fact, it's been used about as long as sheet metal has been used on cars. But for some reason, it's not a widespread art. I say art on purpose, because like any art, it takes practice. And remember, if it doesn't work for you, you can always use your regular repair methods. It also takes special tools to be able to do the job properly. We have here a set of tools that is available through Rotunda for the metal massaging method of dent repair. The set consists of several special tools that are highly polished and refined for this type of work. With carefully rounded ends and no sharp corners or edges. The length and shape of the rods varies to allow you to reach different areas of the body from the access openings that are available. With the rods, the set includes a special high-quality ding hammer with mirror polished surfaces on each end. This finish on the hammer is critical to its proper performance, and if it becomes scratched or nicked, it can't be used until the mirror finish is restored. The tool numbers are included in the reference book that accompanies this disc. Now let's see how they're used. Bob Freeman from the Wixom assembly plant is going to demonstrate the techniques for us. 
Bob has been doing this type of repair work at Whitsum for 25 years. The first step is to find the best access to the area of the dent, and then to decide which tool would be the best to use from that access point. Not all dents will be accessible, and if there is any question, check the parts or collision books for internal structure. For example, this dent in the catwalk of this car is toward the back half of the fender. So the technician gains access to the area by opening the door and sliding the body rod in over the top of the upper hinge. This allows him to reach the area under the dent with the rounded end of the rod and to use the hinge as a fulcrum point to apply pressure against the metal. With the rod in position, he begins to apply pressure gently around the edges of the dent, pushing only as hard as necessary to cause the metal to lift back up into place and slowly working into the center of the depressed area until the surface is smooth and even again. If the area is lifted too far, giving a reverse dent effect, it can be smoothed back down again using the ding hammer. This is why the surface of the hammer must be perfectly smooth. Any nicks or scratches would transfer to the surface of the paint as if the hammer were a typewriter key. The surface can be worked up and down in this manner several times without damage to the finish until the area is perfectly smooth. If the dent is in the front part of the fender area, it can be reached by removing the headlight bezel and sliding the rod in past the lights. In this case, a protective block of wood or fiberglass is used to absorb the pressure of the rod to avoid cracking the front panel. Dents in the upper door handle areas can be reached by blocking the door handle in the up position and reaching the rod in through one of the openings on each side. This requires one of the shorter, wide, curved rods. Here, too, the technician is working the dented area up, starting from the outside edges and working into the middle. To start this process, the first step is to feel for the dent with the end of the rod, and then to determine the extent of it. When the area of the dent is determined, then you start working the metal up using a spiral pattern from the outside edges into the center. This pattern is necessary on large dents because if you tried to lift them directly from the center, you would simply end up with a large dent with a small reverse ding in the middle. Small dents about the size of the end of the rods can be pushed up from the center in one action. It takes practice and experience to know which technique to use on which kinds of dents. When removing dents from the hood or trunk lid using this method, it may be necessary to use a saddle to provide a fulcrum point to get enough pressure under the dented area. This is included as part of the toolkit. As you can see, this area looks as if it had never been dented. The original high quality finish has been preserved and the whole job took minutes, as opposed to the day or more it would have taken to drill, pull, fill, and paint this same area without the same quality results. It's not difficult to do, but it does take practice to develop the feel, as with any art. And it's important to take proper care of your tools, checking and maintaining them daily, like any good craftsman. This non-painting, dent, and ding repair is widely practiced throughout the world. And on today's cars with their advanced new paint and finishing materials, the less repainting and touch-up you do, the better your results will be and the happier your customers will be. It can be done. It just takes practice. Now we're going to show you a different technique for making a non-paint repair on a special kind of surface problem. Depressions or dishes in hoods and deck lids. Hoods and deck lids are made by attaching the outer surface sheet metal to a stamped structural frame underneath for strength. The sheet metal and the frame are bonded together with an adhesive 
at spot points around the frame. These bond points sometimes set up stresses between the two parts of the hood or deck lid that causes the surface to dish in. This stress on aluminum panels can usually be relieved by using a rotunda heat gun on the area of the depression. Heating the area causes the bond creating the stress to release, relieving the pressure and allowing the sheet metal to return to its normal flat position. During this process, the depression will move around and may look even worse initially, but it will come out this way. This can be done from the top so the insulation won't have to be removed from the underside of the hood. On deck lids, the same condition can occur and a heat gun can be used to correct it, just as on the hood. However, if the panel is made of steel, it won't respond as well as aluminum. Since there is no insulation on the underside of the trunk lid, it may be quicker and easier, depending on where the depression is, to simply release the bond that is creating the stress with a putty knife. This method of removing depressions and dishes in hoods and decks is much simpler faster and more effective than trying to fill and repaint them with far better results in preserving the appearance of the car. And it's a technique anyone can learn to do with a little practice. Now let's talk about cosmetic paint repairs. Bob Esker from the Wixom plant will be demonstrating these repair techniques for us. Bob has been making these kinds of repairs at Wixom for 27 years. The first one we'll look at is dirt particles in the paint that affect the finish. The first step in repairing this kind of defect is to scrape the tops off the particles. A single edge razor blade is used to do this. However, the blade cannot be used right out of the package. New single edge blades have sawtooth ridges along the cutting edge, such as we've illustrated here on this model so you can see them. These ridges will scratch the paint and won't cut the dirt particles evenly. To correct this, the blade must first be wetted on a piece of ultra-fine sandpaper. The first step is to round the corners of the blade, as we've exaggerated on this model. This will prevent the corners from digging into and scratching the paint. Then, when the corners are rounded off, the edge of the blade is wetted back and forth to remove the ridges. When the edge of the blade is sharp and smooth, it is used to carefully scrape the tops off the dirt particles, holding it at a vertical angle to the surface with just the thumb and forefinger to balance the pressure on the blade. If three fingers are used, the blade will bend like this, making an uneven cut and gouging the paint in the center. Notice particularly the little round circles left in the paint around each of the dirt particles that has been scraped off. These circles, which we call barometers, are the indicators of how much paint is left on the surface. Circles like this show that the razor blade has just skimmed through the top layer of the paint. Learning to read and use these barometers is very important to being able to make these kinds of color finesse repairs. If you cut too deeply and eliminate them, as on this panel, you will not have a guide as to how much paint is left to work with when polishing out the area, and you may cut through to the primer. If that happens, you'll end up having to repaint after all, defeating the whole purpose of color finesse repairs. Again, learning to read and use the barometers is a matter of practice and experience. Another tool that can be used to remove the heads of dirt particles is a standard putty knife. The end of the putty knife should be squared off with a miller's file, like a bulldozer blade, making sure the edge is smooth so it won't scratch the paint. The knife blade is held at a very low angle and used to push the heads of the dirt off. Then, being very careful to leave the barometers in the paint, after the heads of the dirt particles have been pushed off, the next step is to compound the area using 3M Super Duty Rubbing Compound. To do this, adjoining panels should be taped off
to prevent burn through on the edges and to prevent the compound from getting down in the cracks. When compounding, you should always use a virgin lamb's wool or natural cotton pad. Some synthetic or remanufactured pads will leave the surface hazy. Use a good quality compound like 3M 5955 Super Duty compound that works for you and only use it on small areas at a time so it can be wheeled out while it's still wet. The buffer should be run at no more than 1800 to 2000 RPM. It should also be balanced. That is, it shouldn't shake before you begin buffing and it should be used at a slight angle. If the wheel is unbalanced, it will bounce, and every time it lands, it will leave a mark in the paint. An unbalanced wheel can cause more problems in a few minutes than you can take out in several hours, and it may ruin your job. Watch the barometers carefully when compounding. They tell you how much paint is left and help you to avoid burn through. If that happens, you'll be into the primer and back to repainting again. But don't stop the buffer action too soon either, as this will leave the surface hazy. When the compounding is complete, the residual dust is wiped off and the finish checked against the adjoining panels. If necessary, the area is then hand buffed using a buffing material such as 3M Final Glaze to remove any polishing wheel swirls and bring up the gloss. And there's the finished job looking as if it just came off the assembly line without having to repaint and preserving the quality and appearance of the original factory finish. Another surface problem that happens frequently is minor scratches that do not cut through into the primer or metal. These two can be repaired without having to paint the panel. First, sand the immediate area of the scratches working across the line of the scratches using a hard rubber sanding block and 3M ultrafine or equivalent sandpaper. Work lightly so as not to cut through the paint into the primer, but just enough to even up the surface. With most scratches, after the area has been sanded, it can be hand rubbed using rubbing compound and soft cotton cheesecloth. When preparing the cheesecloth, don't just wad it into a ball. This creates hard spots that will leave streaks. Work it into a nice tight ball so that the outer face is smooth and round. Then put a little compound on the cloth and rub out the area with a circular motion. Keep rubbing until the compound has broken down completely into a fine dust. When the compound is gone and the area rubbed out, wipe off the residual dust with a soft cloth. If necessary, the area can be finished with polish to take out any minute swirl marks and bring up the gloss. Next in our discussion of repairable paint defects, we come to the ugly sag. A problem most people automatically grind off and repaint. But that's not usually necessary. Let's take a look. The first step in repairing a sag is to define the extent of it, to see how far it actually spreads. This is done by drawing a piece of ultrafine sandpaper across the sag area just once in one direction. You can see how this highlights the sag itself. The next step is to prepare a single edge razor blade by wetting it on a piece of ultrafine sandpaper. This time, however, the blade is wetted in only one direction to get as sharp an edge as possible. Again, round off the corners on the sandpaper first so they won't scratch or gouge the paint. When the razor blade is smooth and sharp, very carefully scrape the sag off the surface of the paint. Watch for the barometers and don't scrape so deeply you lose them. They tell you you're still on the top surface of the paint and the color finesse repair will work. On a freshly repainted car, never try to scrape a soft sag as it may tear and then you'll have to repaint again. Once the sag has been scraped, the area can be finished by hand rubbing with compound in the same manner as described in module six on removing surface scratches. 
Because of the nature of metallic particles on some metallic paints, this process may not work, and repainting may be necessary. Another paint problem that can occur is stains in the finish that may be caused by spills, such as transmission, steering, or brake fluid. On factory baked enamel only, after thoroughly washing the vehicle, these can be removed by heating the stain with a heat gun to boil the oil out of the paint. When the oil is pretty well out of the finish, the area is lightly sanded with ultrafine sandpaper to remove any remaining color from the stain. After sanding, the area is rubbed out and polished, and no one will ever know the stain was there. Perhaps one of the most frequent cosmetic repairs required on a vehicle is the touch-up of small chips and craters, especially in door panels. The natural tendency is to simply take a touch-up brush and fill the chip with paint in a matching color. However, this will frequently leave a slightly darker spot where the chip was. To prevent this, only the bottom of the chip should be filled with a single coat of colored paint. When that is flashed, the rest of the chip should be filled with clear coat and then polished. The surface will then be even and the color will match perfectly. Side one of this video disc on cosmetic finish repairs has shown you how to fix several surface defects on a vehicle quickly and easily without having to fill, grind, or repaint. These methods will serve the purpose of preserving the original factory finish, which cannot be duplicated in quality or appearance by any present refinishing method. They also save considerable time and expense in making such repairs. But remember, they all take practice to become good at them, particularly the mechanical method of removing dings and dents. Don't be discouraged if you don't get it the first few tries. It will come in time, and it will be worth developing the skill. A complete summary and outline of all the procedures and materials covered in this disc are contained in the reference book.